actor uh, in the Indian sociological scene. Um, to the students, uh, I have some slides, they are rather busy, uh, so I'll go through them very, very quickly, because I have a very short 15 minutes uh, to complete my presentation. Um, I'm going to speak about wealth, uh, a funny thing, uh, but in very different sort of ways. Um, in the Rata Sastras, you know, the topic of wealth is there, it's very, very explicit and, and dealt with in a very sort of rational, organized sort of kind of way. As is this conversation somewhere in the, in the Panishad between um, this wonderful Maitri uh, and Yanavalkya. Yanavalkya is about to leave for the forest and there goes Maitri troubling him with the question um, of all the wealth that's, uh, that's in the world and if she has to acquire that, would she become a bottle? Um, Yanavalkya being a very patient dude uh, you know, decides to give a, his discourse on um, that look, um, of course she would be and acts like wealthy people, but she will hardly become immortal. So um, he takes the time to sort of explain uh, what all of that means. But I'm concerned more in the third space, leave uh, you know, the Rathasthastras and uh, the Upanishads, uh, come back to my own classroom where students ask me to explain this business of wealth. And um, most of the time I actually confuse them, so I'm really sorry students, you know. Um, but let's see if I can, you know, be a lot more useful to you than to my own students. You see, because what they have taught to me is that, look, um, this notion of wealth it appears to be highly contradictory. Um, you know, there is clashes, there's conflicts um, when you speak about this particular concept. Um, because, you know, if you shift the murder around, what you have is inequality. You have um, a skewness in the way wealth is actually uh, distributed and so on. We hear of the so-called 1% of Oxfam uh, as, you know, in this new calculation of data. So, I'll, I'll begin my uh, presentation with roughly, you know, this uh, guideline. Um, what I want to do uh, essentially is to um, build some kind of an invisible bridge between um, the academy and uh, international civil society. And the reason I want to do this is because um, over the years, you know, uh, through our activism, we've established relationships, uh, you know, with the NGOs and international NGOs and so on. So, what I want to do, um, given, you know, the thematic of this, uh, of this session, um, is to explore the possibility of this bridge actually becoming uh, a reality uh, to address this mammoth question that we refer to as uh, inequality. I'll, I'll speak a little bit about Oxfam, my favorite sort of international NGO, um, and then move on to say Amanda, which is, uh, which is based in, in Rajasthan. Uh, some of you might be very familiar with them. Um, I have, you know, been working with them a little bit. Uh, I don't claim to uh, to have contributed uh, anything, you know, uh, to their wonderful work, but uh, they've been generous in sharing uh, with me some of their knowledge. Um, well, the methodology is very straightforward, students, it's just, you know, reflection, right? Um, and then finally, um, we'll see if we can find a sort of common ground. Um, so just for the students, um, you know, before we uh, build any bridges, we, we have to have definitions and you know, clarify in our own minds what is this uh, nasty concept of social, social justice? Um, because that's the vision, isn't it? That's what we want to achieve. Now, as you know, my students would argue with me, that look, um, ultimately we want to achieve a state of equality, isn't it? And then I would just talk, but do you really believe that the state of equality is actually possible in this world. And, and they would say, but why not? And I would say to them, you know, I just simply don't think that given any number of public policies or interventions, or even, you know, the kinds of theories that we generate, all of that put together is hardly sufficient 
to create a, a situation or a human condition of equality. So then the next question from the students is, does that mean inequality will persist? Um, and um, at that time I want to duck for the cigarette, you know. So I avoid, you know, ducking for the cigarette and I just take the hits uh, that comes from my students. So, so there we are. Um, now when we speak about social justice, we obviously theorize here. And then these would be the different sort of categories, uh, or I think some of them, you know, which we use as a framework um, to sort of get our understanding of, uh, of social justice. Um, so, the struggle for social justice is ongoing. We all know that. Um, you know, it is never fixed. Um, neither does it have a you know, kind of a linear direction. You know, uh, the struggle for social justice uh, doesn't have a single point either. You know, some people believe that the world a social forum is a key focus area you know, of, this, of this massive battle. Actually, it isn't. It's even in the intimate spaces. So, so this grand matrix in which the battle is fought for social justice isn't located you know, in some kind of space-time that's very easy to sort of recognize. It's happening right now, uh, even in this, in this local space. And I can give you a very good definition of it. What if you're brave enough to ask me? Well, at least from the students, I think. So, here's the struggle for justice occurring in these different geographies uh, and then space time. So, what is the origin then of uh, the social justice? Where does it all begin? Uh, you know, this claim for uh, an equality, if you like. Um, is it really located somewhere, you know, in uh, this industrial revolution, which is somewhere, you know, in the western part of the world? Um, you know, is it uh, amongst the social democratic formations, which, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, western countries seem to have adopted as, as welfare models for themselves? Or do they, you know, nest somewhere in, in some you know, Christian sort of domains, which became part of the you know, of the domination of the rest of the world, and I, my colleagues from New Zealand would testify to some of those injustices that occurred, uh, you know, during these uh, different periods of histories. Um, and, uh, you know, the meaning of total income equality, you know, total income equality, again, the argument with my students, features there. So, social justice is actually idealized, isn't it? Um, in these different, you know, conceptual, you know, sort of uh, uh, frameworks, if you like. So, take your pick institutionally, spatially, uh, as well as, you know, within the jurisprudence itself. And then, finally, you know, can we identify those four values of this uh, wonderful concept of social justice? Maybe, yes. I think, I think this is incomplete, you know. Uh, it's asking for the equal treatment of all people. Uh, I'm very suspicious about that, you know, because when I'm eating my sort of lunch, uh, even here, you know, there is a, there is clearly, you know, some kind of uh, social structures actually uh, in place here. So I don't, I don't, I don't buy that story. Right? Um, the respect for diversity, uh, democratic practice, uh, human rights, and this egalitarian distribution of. Uh, of the sources. Um, for me, rather, I, I think this is what's more important, you know, those challenges uh, around achieving social justice. So, um, what I think about this is that it actually belongs within some kind of shifting, you know, uh, time space, space time, if you like, uh, you know, that kind of shifting zip is, because, you know, nothing is fixed. So social justice you know, can't be defined within a singular you know, kind of space-time for that. So it needs to move within human history. Um, and that somehow it is uh, suppressed. Uh, and you know, uh, it is retarded, if you like, that um, by intellectual inputs. You know, people like you and I, you know, with, um, who actually uh, you know, are responsible for this. Um, we do it in our... Uh, intellectual pursuits, you know, and compare, you know, some of the kind of theories that we've developed in our respective disciplines. Um, 
But then, you know, we also complain by these liberal and conservative contrasting views. So, um, you know, I think it was, uh, what was it, Wallace Steen who said, you know, they, that, that the human condition has its limits. He identified three of them. It's in the Dottachian report. But I'll just pick on one. Um, the universal and the particular will never meet. And he's right. And I, I believe the guy. Um, you know, so, so the space between the universal and the particular is a very vast one. Okay? So that's what I mean by this liberal and conservative. I just use that as an example. But then finally, um, this increasing pressure from states themselves uh, on civil society. Uh, states are somehow feeling, you know, very, very threatened by civil society. And that's an obvious statement to make, you know, it's, it's happening all the time. So, uh, fortunately, you know, social justice remains on the agenda. Um, it, uh, you know, those powerful forces in the world hasn't been able to suppress it. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, uh, you know, I'm sort of uh, intrigued by that. But given the enormous power, you know, of, uh, of the global capitalist logic, that it hasn't been able to, uh, to shut down, you know, civil society in any comprehensive uh, sort of way. Somehow, uh, you know, civil society gets up again, uh, it resurrects itself, it, it, it reorganizes itself, and that's the, the beauty of all of this. So, um, you know, you see for yourselves these different formations. I just use the World Socialist, uh, you know, so the World Social Politics as, as one example. Clearly, it isn't. Um, you know, uh, indigenous societies all over the world are putting on valiant struggles, you know, uh, around the issues that, uh, that affect them. Wherever there might be 